Um, thank you so, so, so much for having me here. It's, it's a privilege to be here. It's like the wildest dream ever to be in Kathmandu. So I'm still pinching myself, honestly. Um, and I'm sorry that biography is such a mouthful. I should work on it more. <laughs> Um, I'm going to talk today about a work that is about algorithms and bias. But first, I'm going to give a little context uh, of previous projects, just to kind of talk a little bit of how is that I arrived where I am. Um, I've been living in London for 20 years now. I think I should mention that. And so in a way, my, my, my way of doing things is very Western in that sense. Um, also, very recently, I discovered that my family comes from a, an indigenous community. And so that has created a series of questions and problems and conflicts and interesting um, discoveries recently for my practice. So, um, 2014, I'm in a conversation in a dinner party and someone talks about Mars One project in the Netherlands. People wanting to go to Mars and never coming back. And everyone is just like really surprised that people want to do that. And I'm just really surprised that we're having this conversation that I thought it was part of the far future. But here we are having this conversation that is kind of a sci-fi um, movie kind of thing. Um, I was fortunate enough to have a grant or get a grant through school. And that allowed me to follow six scientists in the UK who were shortlisted for this Mars One project. And I followed them for about um, two months. And very quickly, I became very aware that I was missing the Earth and that um, there was a question that kept on repeating in my mind that why would we want to go to Mars? if we have Mars on Earth. And so I discovered there were three little towns um, around the world called, called Mars, and I went um, to the one in Pennsylvania, because I'm Mexican, and I thought that it's very rare to see a uh, Mexican portraying um, the, the Americana in, in all its mythology and, and all its kind of, uh, yeah, historical framework. So I'm going to play a little animation that I did for the augmented reality. And I'm just going to talk about after that, um, why is that I use a mental reality for this? Hopefully it will work. Currently it takes six to eight months to go to Mars the wrong way. Keeping astronauts alive and healthy for six to eight months. There'll be waiters on their way there. The radiation environment is quite hazardous. They have a legal limit to the radiation they are allowed to be exposed to. So I'm going to stop it there. <laughs> um, I'm always, since I studied photojournalism, I became really interested in the limits of the image. It was very obvious and evident for me from the very beginning that the frame um, leaves out a series of things that nevertheless they inform the way we construct an image in our heads. And so all the time since I graduated, I started wondering what, can I, what could I do to, to include all of what's left outside the frame but that, but that nevertheless is informing the way we're reading the images and we're constructing the mythology of whatever we're seeing in our heads. And so I started working with um, augmented reality as a way of including um, other series of things that are kind of more boring, less, less exciting from an exploration point of view, which are the space law side, the human rights side, the exploration of resources side of space exploration. Um, and then I started making some sculptures and interactive installations because I'm very interested in getting young people kind of touching things. I feel that we live in a world where physical things are disappearing. So I developed this series of um, sculptures that went around um, mainly in Europe because it's kind of troublesome to transport them to Mexico. So they haven't been in Mexico yet. Um, here's another uh, example of the installation, and usually the installation also has augmented reality, so it's something that you touch, but you also access some of that other intangible side of the story within the, with the use of the phone. Um, and there's another type of, you know, sculptures. Um, what I find really interesting is that the work keeps evolving, and so every exhibition opportunity is always like a very good way of exploring new ways of expanding or changing or taking out stuff from the work. So for me, the work is never fixed. And I think from the very beginning, I said, you know, it's 2014, this is a long-term project. I'm going to be working in it quite possibly, hopefully for the rest of my life. Um, because their technology is going to change, 
my position towards what is happening is going to change. And I cannot assume that I'm going to know everything from now of what's going to happen in the next generations when actually going to the moon becomes a reality. I don't know exactly how ecologically our philosophical position towards the Earth will be. I hope we are still very rooted in ecology and, and really rooted in the Earth and we haven't given up on Earth. Um, but it was, it was always very important for me just to kind of leave the work, breathe and be open and, yeah change and say, you know, I, I'm just one person and I don't know everything. Um, so also whenever I give talks about this work, I also open the question to other people who are interested in doing work about space exploration to reach out to me so we bring together different voices and different types of points of view on the, on the subject. Then I was lucky enough to get a small prize and so then I got a book published that now has been included in this publication by the Vien uh, Victorian Albert Museum. The book included the augmented reality as well. And then I'm going to show you that. So, so then, as you see, that, that was the Augmented Reality app. Um, it's almost like a children's pop-up book, the way the animations work. And it includes this extra layer of information. From the very beginning, it was very important for me to have the phys physical book. And I was very aware that the technology would change. You know, like my phone, I don't think that the app works anymore in my phone. So then I thought, so be it, you know, at some point, because my point of view is going to change eventually, maybe the videos can change as well. And so that was exciting. Or maybe it stops existing, right? And then you have the book, and that was exciting as well. Um, and so then what it happened with the AR and the sculptures while I was showing it in Europe is that more and more people were really surprised that this was my work. And I started noticing this. And they were like thinking that they were giving me a compliment, saying like, oh, I thought it was a man who made this big sculpture, no? It's so great that you did it. And I was just like, that sounds so patronizing. Um, <laughs> and I don't know if you realize, but it's a little offensive. Um, and, and then I would show the augmented reality, and they would be like, oh, you did this? Like, with very surprise. And so little by little, I, I realized that there was the credibility gap, right? What Rebecca Solnit calls the credibility gap, in which people of color have no um, credibility when talking about certain issues. And I'm a woman, I'm a woman of color, I look a certain way, I speak a certain way. So I'm not expected to be talking about these issues. And, and so then, parallel to this, I discovered that my grandma is part, was part of a community, an indigenous community. And, and she doesn't want to talk about it because there's a lot of violence and, 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 and yeah, uh, complicated stories that I'm doing another project on that. Um, and there's a lot of shame around, the, around this part of the history of the family. And I think what it was interesting in discovering that I somehow not entitled to have an opinion towards a, such a Western male um, issue. At the same time, I'm discovering this other side of my identity in which there's a certain view on ecology and nature and knowledge that I see there's a gap within this Western way of approaching ideas of progress and growth and ecology. And so then I encounter myself at that point where almost ruggedly, I decide that I'm going to start doing work about technology and science. That's what I'm going to do. Um, and at the same time, as things happen, sometimes also work hits you on the face and doesn't let you go. So these are the Trump years, and these are the years of Brexit. And suddenly, the Facebook that we think is so inoffensive is shaping elections, and is shaping the way we approach each other, and is shaping the way we see each other. And so I started researching on that. And, and you know, at the time, there was one book that it was seminal, which is um, Weapons of Math Destruction by Cathy O'Neill. She's an Irish uh, mathematician and scientist. 
by now, I mean, I'm referring to 2018, by now there are so many books about it. You know, it's much more known that, that, that algorithms and search engines and so on do shape our world and do have an impact in the physical. But at that time, I was very curious in how to connect this thing that me, myself, I, I felt so very intimidated by it. Everyone would call algor tell, tell me about algorithms and I would think mathematics. I was like, never good at mathematics. And it sounds so abstract that I don't know to even where to start, right? And, and, and so I started investigating and researching and talking with um, coders and it's like they're talking a different language and so on. Um, and at the same time, I start talking about discrimination with friends in Mexico because of my grandma's story, um, as a way of processing this story that suddenly comes into light. Um, and I discovered that everyone has a story to tell. I mean, this is 2019, and everyone has a story of discrimination to tell. And I speak with almost 100 people, I write the stories, I have sound recordings, I have video recordings, I have sketchbooks and so on. And at the same time, I get this grant uh, from Lucy Foundation. And this grant allows me to go into the, into the studio. I, I never thought that this was going to be portraits. I just went in and started exploring ideas of body language because I studied performance. And I was interested in body, I'm interested in body politics. So I went into the studio for, for about a month and started exploring ideas of how to position the body in painful positions. Um, I discovered the algorithms are called black boxes. So from the very beginning, the only thing that I knew is that everything in the background should, need, should be black. And I had like three tables with costumes and props and stuff. And I started exploring these, these postures and started holding these postures. Um, very quickly became clear to me that I couldn't ask someone else to do this. So they, they ended up being self-portraits almost naturally. And, and the reason for this is that uh, I discovered that my body in a way had become an archive for all the pain and all the discrimination that people had related to me. And within my notes, I had all these notes of, um, you know, you clench your body in a certain way, you move your hand in another way, you are all clenched when you are recalling something that happened to you that actually took a little bit of your dignity, even if it, if it was a microaggression and so on. And I decided that that was a, a bank of experience that somehow uh, I could use to, to, to portray something that is quite uncomfortable for people to go through. Um, the idea of covering my face came because there's a lot of, um, I wanted to produce images that were not immediately accessible to a Western audience. I thought that it was important to speak my own dialect in a way and to produce images that Latin American people or Mexican people would get almost immediately. And part of it was the hair politics. In, in Mexico in particular, um, indigenous communities, the women have long hair. And if you are wanting to look at yourself as a modern woman, you would cut your hair. And I thought that if I would show my face, people would immediately look in my features, and then they would look at the rest of the details in the image. And I wanted people to really forget about my face. But also, eventually, I discovered that by erasing my face somehow, I was alluding to this metaphor of how discrimination lumps us all together and a sense of individuality completely disappears, and we suddenly become this group that is identified by certain qualities. And so I went with the hair, <laughs> and there are days that I look at it and I think, what was I thinking? And there are other days that I think, oh no, that's all right, I, I still like it. Um, the words that you see, they came from that research of the tags, um, of the headlines, um, that I found by doing Google searches. So at the time during my research, I was traveling between Mexico, the US and the UK, and I performed web searches with the terms Mexicans, why Mexicans are considered Mexican women and so on. And I noticed that depending on the place that I was, the image search would be different. And people have asked me, how did that happen? Because the ITP usually is kind of the same in your phone. And I say, you know, I went into internet cafes or I would use a friend's phone. I would use different devices because I was curious what information different people were getting. 
And I discovered that the internet is not as, um, as unbiased as, or neutral. Or an, I don't know if the word is all-encompassing as we would like it to be. Um, I discovered that depending on the geography, I would find different um, web search results. And that was, I, I have to say, a little surprising. So in Mexico at the time, there were a lot of uh, protests um, that went into El Ángel de la Independencia, which is a main landmark in Mexico City. And they were feminist protests. And there was a lot of that on the news. And there were a lot of Facebook posts about it. And so when I did the search on Mexican women, that's what would come up a lot. Um, when I went into the US, thanks to Donald Trump, um, or enforced by Donald Trump's rhetoric, a lot was about immigration and bad hombre and bad people and the drug, the war against drugs and so on. Um, <clears throat> and then when I went to the UK, it was pretty much about cervezas and nachos, tacos, sombreros, <laughs> uh, hot ladies. And then at some point after like 50 web search results, uh, it started like Colombians and Salvatorians. We started all being mixed together. And the common thread uh, would be the, the, the war against the drugs or the violence in, in, in these countries. And I thought that's really interesting because then depending on the geography and where you are, is a certain type of knowledge that you are getting. So we're not getting all the same type of knowledge. And, and knowledge and the way knowledge is constructed is something that has been my obsession since the beginning of getting into photography. Um, so then I'll change the slide because that one has been for too long. Um, so then, I mean, the, the postures and all of these, I think what is interesting for me is that they were very organic. I ended up with about 40 images from which I am using 20. The, the graphics that you see, they are hand drawn directly on the print. So, so when I show, I don't like showing these images because usually that's what I do. I, thought I, I draw directly on them. And so the composite doesn't really reflect how the print and the manual labor that goes into it doesn't show it at all. Um, but it takes me about, I don't know, depends on the size, but that one took me about a um, good three weeks to finish it. And it's only because, you know, prints are very expensive and the, the method that I, I'm using metallic prints with a very fine pen. So the method that I chose for myself for some reason is very hard and not, not surprised there. And so then I have to like draw a line and then step back and then make sure that nothing blotched and so on. Um, and the drawings go in between these tags, which are kind of a measurement, a classification of a body, right? And one of the things that I, I'm obsessed and discover within my research with algorithms is that because they are mathematics, they carry a tradition of classification. And this technology that suddenly has promised us that is kind of all-encompassing and equalitarian and uh, expanding, ever-expanding, somehow has carried the human biases that have been there in our society for years. And I think this is something that is quite interesting. The more time passes, the more we discover that this is, this is the case. But at the time when I, when I started making the work, I sounded a little bit crazy and kind of conspirational. Um, but now we have more research and we have more kind of proof. And, and it looks like that's, that's what it has happened, that there's not only about let's produce more images that represent less in a, in a the representational balance, let's say, is not about putting more images into the internet, but it's about the system in itself. The way in which the system and the formulas and the definitions within those formulas exist at the moment, and the model, the economical model in which these formulas exist at the moment, are completely unbalanced and unbiased and unequalitarian. Do you have any questions? Because I feel like we should open the questions like a conversation more than anything else. No, don't be shy. I can ask one question. Yes, please. If you just go back to that last slide, so has this been enlarged or is that the same size that we saw in the desk? That's the same size. Okay. Yes, yeah, so that's an A0. Yeah, exactly, like scale is completely lost, right? It's weird. 
So, so th that one there looks like so small, but it's so big. <laughs> and it is a lot of work making it, um, but it's like the size of my whole studio. So I have a very tiny studio. So that's a zero size. That's a zero. So you can see it more there. Um, so this, was, this is how it was shown in York in the UK, and this was part of a short list of the Aesthetica Prize in 2021. And that's how we decided to show it, like uh, almost like an intervention in the room, people would be able to go around it. The image that is there, um, this one here, has augmented reality and is positioned that way because the augmented reality comes again like from the image like this, and I'll show you an animation of it in a minute. But it was very important for me, like almost, the, they, they had this kind of heaviness to them that it was not just the flat surface, but it was something that had a presence in the, in the space. Um, and then again, you know, some people like it and some people think, oh no, it's too heavy, it's too boxy. So this is another way that we presented it in the Biennale for Actual Photography in Mannheim last year in Germany, in the Wilhelm Hack Museum. So we kept the boxes for the augmented reality prints, but we didn't for the other ones on the wall, as you can see. And then why not? I decided that I wanted to do a live performance because I thought there's something that needs to keep on being enacted. And because it's so performative, the idea of race and identity and the way I saw it kind of developing in these images. And because I feel that sometimes I have to act as more Mexican than the Mexican that I am, being abroad for so long, it's almost like I'm requesting, like, show us how Mexican you are, right? So it's like, I thought there was something interesting in like kind of standing up and owning this space and showing how these formulas impregnate on my body and mark my body and define my body physically. Because that's the whole point of this project, of kind of connecting something that is very abstract and digital with the physical world and how it shapes it and how it defines it, because it does. So then on the wall, what we did, we had the code for a film that I'll show you in a minute that is a generative adversarial network film. Um, for short, is GAN. This GAN is what is used to train AI to visualize images nowadays. So it's what Google uses to determine patterns in image for image searches. And so I work with a coder and we try to teach a computer to look at women not wearing bikinis. Um, and it all came from a, an article in The Guardian in which I read that there was an experiment in MIT where a um, portrait of Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez was shown to an AI, and just like her portrait. And they asked the computer, would you complete her, total, complete, you know, put the body to her. And the computer decided that it was more likely that she would be wearing a bikini, just because of the type of images that the computer, and the data set in which the computer had been taught to see women, Latin women, and so it, com it completed her. And then they showed the picture of another MP, a male MP, and it completed him wearing a suit. And I remember being like, oh, this is interesting. It's kind of, it calls for, um, for an artwork. So we tried to, to teach a computer to, to see women, Latin women, not wearing bikinis. And this is the, the code that we use for that. And I'll show it to you in a minute. Seeing your work for the first time, um, that uh, the, the images, you know, where you're binding yourself and your face is not seen and the body is in quite difficult positions. It makes me think also of some work of Bunnu's and Uma's here and, you know, that expression of pain through the body when women do it, I always wonder, like, doesn't that leave a deeper residue then? You know, having to see yourself again like that and then putting yourself in these difficult binding positions, these images that can feel very painful and violent to look at. How, how does it affect you? I mean, oh, that's something I want. How, do you, how does it affect your body when you're making those images? Yeah. Like, I always wonder when women artists are choosing to represent that, how it affects them, you know, yeah. psychologically. So that's a very interesting question. Thank you for asking it, actually. Um, complicated. So there are different layers to that, to that answer. Um, one is... The positions, I held them for about 10 minutes before making the, the, the photo. And I thought, I, I was curious to see how much of that pain and that tension would come across. And it, it does not come across. And that's interesting, I think. That's a question that is still floating in the air in my head for future work. 
and um, the more my work becomes performative and it becomes more like these interventions of putting my body in landscapes where I'm not supposed to belong to, this is how it's developing. Um, the residue of it, my whole body language is based on these histories, right? And I'm very, I become, I think the enlightening side of it is that I became very aware of my body language and how I, the position of my back, how I'm very kind of, um, I, I'm very self-deprecating. You know? um, so it's an interesting, it becomes like, I think, a life-changing exercise into how you position your world, how you, how you speak. One of the things that I'm thoroughly enjoying about um, developing this work is in questioning why is that someone like me do not speak about these things, and it's about finding ways of using indigenous knowledge and repositioning it within a scientific context. That's where I am at now. So all this kind of pain and um, resistance comes back as, as something positive, I think as something that I'm thinking that maybe younger women who look a little bit like me or come from very similar backgrounds can think like, oh yeah, I can get into science, why not? Oh yeah, I can make a mental reality, why not? Oh yeah, I, have a, I actually can speak about these issues that I can see affecting my community from a scientific point of view and talk about the knowledge in my community from a scientific point of view, not from a, a curious indigenous kind of a mythology. Um, so I think yeah, I think it's important going through, and I, I don't mind going through it. I wouldn't say it's traumatizing. There are other things that are traumatizing in daily life. Mm. Yes. So, okay. So I think this is the augmented reality, uh, the way it was shown in King's Cross in London through the Photographer's Gallery, I hope, yeah. So that's um, a screen recording. This was recently shown last summer, uh, supported by the Photographer's Gallery, and we show it in the King's Cross uh, St. Pancras area in Granary Square. And as you can see, people do not pay attention to things, and that's like really exciting because it really makes you, you know, step on your toes and like realize that you, you have to be less precious about the work and then find new strategies for get people engaged in different ways. Um, so this is one of the ways it looks if the photo is up. And as you see, it's very easy for me to change it. In this case, the animation gets out from the picture, but in this other case, is on the picture. So that's also something very exciting in the sense that uh, how the technology is evolving very quickly. The app for the new colonists, I made it with a friend and they taught me and I got like a, it was very important for me to understand the whole process, right? Because otherwise you cannot engage critically into these things if you don't understand how they're made. And so, but this one, I use another thing that is called Artivive and it's free and it's so easy to use. So I'm using this one, uh, in this case, the Artivive one um, to make these ones. And what was interesting about this is like in this square in particular, they have fountains in the background and this afternoon it was empty because it, there was no sunshine, but usually in the summer it's full with children playing. And so you could see the children putting their hands on the prints and like just playing with it. And, and then at some point I saw a little kid just like looking at the words and the part of the game was like reading these words. And I thought like, oh, wow, you know, like I'm happy. I can, I can die happy now. Like, that's how you want your work at some point, right? Not in a gallery space. I mean, gallery spaces are great. But like this, it just kind of brings a different dimension to the work, I think. Um, and then after doing this, because, because the, the, the way these things work is like you make the work and then more questions arrive, right? So we made the coder that I was collaborating with and myself, we made this um, website da database in which we uploaded all these images that we researched and the images that we trained the GAN with. And then we started writing to each other. We've never met uh, face to face. Um, she's in the Netherlands and I'm in London. So we started writing letters to each other, talking about the questions that we were finding. And, and, and some of these questions had to do with the process in which we trained the AI. And we discovered that this notion we had that we were unbiased was completely and absolutely untrue. I was going to say a rude word, and thank God I stopped myself. Um, but you know, like, we discovered that 
the process in itself is discriminatory and you need and you end up leaving by by choice certain groups outside of your data set um, we also discovered that the only way to train with this amount of images was by mining images from the internet and she said to me this in the netherlands is illegal and i feel quite dirty and disappointed that we're doing this right so we ended up documenting all, all of these because we think that not many people know about these processes and not many people, like I talk about these things all the time, right? With my friends and my students and people and here and so on. And then of course I go to my grandma and I go to my mom and dad and they just like, what are you talking about? Like I just got into Facebook. And so we realized that it was important to somehow leave a document behind of some sort in which we were kind of showing the process through which we went into doing these things. And so then these are the types of images that began this film made by a computer from the images that we fed into um, launched. Um, and this is the fascinating part. We started with 250 images and the images that we got back were very similar to these. We then said, oh, we cannot see a face, this is kind of weird, let's feed it more. So we ended up giving it a thousand images. And it kept on being very similar to this. Okay, let's go for more. Okay, 2,000, 3,000. We stopped at 5,000 because our eyes were bleeding at looking and we needed sunshine. And, and, and the images were the same. And so in a way what this says is that the more doesn't necessarily mean the better information that you get back. It also says within this framework and this formula, it doesn't matter how much you enter it, it's always going to give you similar answers. Variations, infinite variations, but similar answers. And I think for me, in that sense, that was very enlightening. Because I always think of, the, of, of technology and the internet as a hyper object, as something infinite. And I discovered that it's not, the way it's designed right now is very geared up onto certain models of business. And within these models, the information is very limited. Questions? Questions? No. Yes. Yes. Yes, because we, we realized, for example, one of the biases was like, okay, so women not wearing bikinis, we realized that it could be people not wearing clothes, right? They, would, they wouldn't be necessarily wearing a bikini, but because we started with this ideal notion of not wearing a skimpy clothes, then we discarded people not wearing clothes. And then, of course, we realized that it was very non-binary, very binary, so we expanded it to non-binary. So it was more like femmes rather than women. And so we ended up with a very, very large variety of images, yes. And what is interesting, I was thinking about this today, there are no eyes. It's like <laughs> they're empty masks, soulless masks like the ones that I put on myself, making these self-portraits. I was thinking about that today, like these are things that you see only on retrospect on the work, without overanalyzing it or overthinking it, you know? But I thought, this is how computers see us. They see us like this, <laughs> they're just information to them, soulless objects of information. Yes. So, okay, so then I have another, because I was really worried that I was going to lose my voice halfway through. So I edited a little, tiny little video. And so I'm just going to play it. And it has a little bit of a performative thing within it. And it's about 15 minutes. So it's just going to be about time. Um, so yes, I'm just going to do that.
past, racist graffiti, defamation of religious buildings, and acts of vandalism were used to measure the amount of racial hostility and hate in society. Twitter's posts are today's forum for writing on the walls, where people openly express their thoughts, opinions, and beliefs. Unlike in-person conversations, where individuals may be less inclined to use racial slurs, racial language is often used openly on social media platforms like Twitter. Although Twitter is smaller relative to popular social media platforms like Facebook, Facebook, for example, is a closed social network, whereas Twitter is an open forum and exerts an outsized influence of conversation. Twitter is also based on less in-person relationships and offers less personalization and greater anonymity. Hidden derogatory perceptions can potentially be expressed on Twitter and the consequences of viewing the pain caused by these online actions may not be as easily apparent. These unfiltered contents on Twitter may offer a public reflection of negative attitudes and discriminatory views towards certain demographic groups that would otherwise not be possible to capture using traditional survey instruments. Racist and discriminatory language on platforms like Twitter has become the racist graffiti of our time. For example, a disgruntled waitress tweeted, if we had a real life purge, I would kill as many Mexicans as I could in one night. This is because of the lack of tips she received from a Mexican patron at the restaurant. In July 2008, Luis Ramirez, a Mexican undocumented migrant, was beaten to death by several young men in Pennsylvania. This happened while he was walking home one evening. Witnesses reported that the assailants yelled racial epithets at Ramirez as they attacked him. His non-Hispanic white fiancé and the mother of his two children, Krista Dillman, was quoted as saying of the four teenagers, I think they might get off because Luis was an illegal Mexican and these are all American boys on the football team who get good grades or whatever they're saying about them. They will find some way to let them go. In 2008, Rodolfo Olmedo was dragged down by a group of men shouting anti-Mexican epithets and bashed over the head with a wooden stick on the street outside his home. The first of 11 suspected attacks that year motivated by anti-Hispanic bias in the neighborhood of State Island. The U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, and the U.S. Border Patrol have been frequently criticized for alleged anti-Mexican speech and actions. In July 2019, more than 60 Border Patrol agents were investigated over their participation in a Facebook page that mocked Mexicans, immigrants, and minority lawmakers. I have been luckier than many. Before this incident, the closest I'd ever come to blatant racism was in junior high. I was in the jazz band and played the first trumpet. One day, our jazz band teacher invited in his predecessor, a local legend who had made Eagle Rock High School's jazz program famous in the 1980s. The visiting instructor pointed me out and asked me to play him 16 bars of music. I did, but he quickly interrupted. Stop, stop, stop. I don't want to hear any of that mariachi music. This is jazz. I didn't think anything of it. Instead, I felt terrible that the legend standing in front of me didn't think I was good enough. I went home that night, and like every night at 6.30 p.m., my family sat down for dinner to talk about our day. How is your day, Nikki? My dad asked. So I told him, and outraged, the next day he went to my principal and filed a formal complaint. The legend didn't come back to visit the jazz program again. Weeks later, we received a letter in the mail from him apologizing for his insensitive comments. My family saved the letter. My father was hypersensitive to ethnic identity and deeply proud of his Latino heritage. The son of a naturalized immigrant from El Salvador and a Mexican mother from Texas, he grew up in Los Angeles during a time of racial tension. When I was young, he would tell me stories of the race riots in his high school, violence against people of color, and awful accounts of the struggle he had to make through as a Mexican-American teen in the 1960s. He died when I was 17 years old, but one of the phrases he implanted in my mind before he passed was a statement activist Cesar Chavez made famous. Si se puede. Yes, you can. 
And now, here I was, at 28, with this stranger yelling at me to leave, leave, go home. I stood there in the middle of a damn crowd on a late Atlanta evening. I didn't say a thing. I didn't have to. The crowd around us looked in amazement at this woman. The band played a few more songs before ending the set, and the crowd dispersed across the park into the Saturday evening. As I walked away, the woman and I locked eyes. I don't think you understand who you said that to, I told her, thinking to myself, I am as American as you are. What, she said, laughing, are you some kind of celebrity or something? No, but like the Mexicans I was standing with, I'm a human being and I am home. Soy de Guerrero, Oaxaca, Guadalajara, Michoacán, Chihuahua, Yucatán, Chiapas. Soy de Aguascalientes, Baja California Norte, Campeche. Soy de Morelos, soy de Tamaulipas. Soy de Tlaxcala, Zacatecas, Estado de México, Nuevo León, Quintana Roo. Soy de Veracruz. Soy de Durango, Colima, Coahuila, Hidalgo. Soy de Guanajuato, Distrito Federal, Nayarit, Querétaro. Soy de Puebla, Tabasco, Sonora, Sinaloa. De Puebla otra vez, Baja California Sur y San Luis Potosí. Veo estas imágenes y no me veo en ellas. Aún a pesar de que estas imágenes son como yo, no hay nada de mí en ellas. Esta imagen que completamente cambia totalmente no soy yo. Está solamente pretendiendo que es alguien como yo. No refleja nada ni a nadie que yo conozco. Y aún así, se supone que son como alguien como yo, a, afuera de alguien como yo. Una fantasía que ha permanecido a través de los tiempos. Una fantasía en esteroides, que ahora es más real que yo. Y que aparece monstruosa, monstruosa resemblanza de mí misma. No me reconozco en estas imágenes aún a pesar de que se supone que son yo. Es un espejo distorsionado que se ha convertido 
en mi reflejo. Se ha convertido en un monstruo, un monstruo que es más real que yo. Y este monstruo es la única cosa que acierta mi existencia. of gain or loss as a consequence of identity claims. Power is implicated here. Often notions of superiority and inferiority are embedded in particular identities. <laughs> Buffoon, criminal, ugly, corrupt, violent. I, I hate that computers voice, but I thought it was quite important that it sounded dorky in a way, <laughs> so I left it. And so that's it. I mean, I'm, if you have questions, let's open the questions. But this image um, is an image of a body of work in which I'm currently working on for a show uh, at Autograph with Bindi Vora, who, who's here for 2024. And, and it's kind of opening like a different realm for me. It's a, an, an intersection in between technology and science and indigenous knowledge. As I said, it's very important to me at this point to kind of um, insert, not to kind of, to insert indigenous knowledge within an, a scientific context. Um, so that's what I'm doing with, with this new project that is going to be out in 2024. And there's a little iteration of it or a version of a testing version here in Kanvanu in the photo festival. So I'm testing ideas that you can see in the exhibition that is here um, for this project. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Monica. Thank you. Um, do we have any questions? I'm sure there are a lot of questions. I have a question. Um, so since you said that you have a background where you studied photojournalism and mm. even when you, uh, other works that you have done um, in your website and also when you're presenting uh, in the mass class when I, where I was also part of, uh, I remember you had work uh, that followed a very different kind of approach uh, uh, which is more inclined towards the classical Photojournalism, a documentary photography where you basically go to a place and you know take images and and slowly over the years I see uh, in your work you know your practice has changed your aesthetic has changed your way of looking at the research has changed I'm too young to ask this question to you I think but still I just I'm just curious about this transition that has happened you know. Um, can you remember of that uh, a point in in your life, in your creative uh, life, in your you know professional life, mm -hmm. where you took a decision, or it automatically, organically happened, or like mm -hmm. uh, what happened? Why did you shift from? How did your understanding of the image shifted? Mm -hmm. Do I make sense? Yeah. 
Yes, okay. but it hasn't it hasn't ended. You know, I think I'm still a student of the image, and I think it was very organic. The change was very organic, and I think I'm still I'm hoping I'm still <laughs> doing making documents. So maybe it's not like the the same documentary or type of documentary photography that I studied when I did the masters at LCC. Um, but it, for me, it's pretty much a document of, of some sort. Um, and it keeps on being a document. I'm obsessed with this notion of spectacle and how you can break the spectacle and, and how this defines so many ways in which we construct images. So I think by putting myself through the process of the image itself, is almost like accepting that I am part of this spectacle, that I am part of this document, that we all are this document. So it's not, it's not self-involved. I will really like fingers crossed that people are not thinking, oh my God, she's putting herself in it. So it's all so self-obsessed, right? Because it's not about that. It's just about kind of almost accepting that part of the discourse, that I am the discourse as much as everyone else, and that is subjective, and that it changes and is personal and is influenced and shaped completely by my context and my sociopolitical upbringing and all these things. And I think that the only way of showing that is, for now, putting myself in it. But, but I also find quite an interesting tension, right? There are spaces in which I, I don't belong visually, and, and suddenly to position myself within these spaces make, make this tension in people's minds. And I like that a lot, like that disruption of like, so for example, for me to say out loud indigenous science, the, I remember the first time I said it, there was like a short circuit in my head, right? And I was like, why is that happening? <laughs> because I'm so colonized that I don't think there's indigenous science, right? And so I think in a way is, is that like, that thing of like the document is, there are so many different versions of the document. And so now I'm just like kind of exploring which other versions of the document can we produce nowadays when the image is so fluid and, and the context of it changes so much once you put it online and, and you tag it differently. How, how can we make new documents that counteract that kind of fluidity and this playfulness between fluid and fixed and so, yeah. I don't think I answered the question because I don't have the answer. <laughs> But, it, but, but it's like, it's, it's, a, it's a process. I think it's an ongoing process. 